everybody. Uh, my name is Joey Parrott. I'm Angular's developer infrastructure lead. That's developer infrastructure for the Angular team, not for everyone else, unfortunately. Uh, though a lot of the same things do apply. So um, today I wanted to look at a few pieces of our infrastructure and tooling and kind of what we do um, to manage such a large project on GitHub. Uh, before we actually look at what we do to manage things, I want to talk about a, a bit about what dev infra means to me. <laughs> um, so first, uh, as we all know, Angular, part of Angular's goal is to uh, enable developers to make great applications. So dev infra enables Angular to enable developers to make uh, great applications. So we do this through um, trying to make the people who make Angular as efficient as possible through with our tooling and processes. So as I mentioned, we're pretty busy on GitHub. Uh, every week, we receive more than 120 issues and 135 pull requests. And we need to be as efficient as possible uh, to get through all of these things. So much of this efficiency, I like to think at least, comes from that dev infra work. So uh, dev infra is typically a black box for people. Uh, if it's working properly, you don't think about it, you don't hear about it, and you shouldn't need to. But um, today, we're going to kind of look inside that black box, so to speak, at three things um, that I kind of want to cover. Uh, inactive closed issues um, and kind of uh, the way that we are now automatically locking those. Um, building Angular itself, building the framework um, as fast as we, as we can. And then also um, some of the, the uh, ways that we uh, consistently manage our repositories on GitHub itself. So first, we'll talk about keeping conversations current. So here's the problem. Over time, one of the biggest sources of noise in our repositories is actually from people that are from comments that happen on issues or PRs that have been closed and, in and haven't been updated for a super long time. Somebody come in, comes in and comments something like, me too, which isn't really helpful to the conversation, plus it's closed. Or they comment and say, I'm having this issue still, but they can't, but now we've actually fixed it, so the context is, is not there anymore. And it, it just creates a bunch of notifications for people that result in us asking them to just open a new issue with new context. So how can we actually minimize that noise? So we minimize that noise by encouraging people to have the conversations in the, in the relevant locations. So, uh, we can prevent reviving these dead conversations and instead encourage people to just create a new issue by locking and leaving a message saying, hey, if you're still having this, just go ahead and do so. So I actually am going to walk through how we do this, um, specifically in our, in our repository. Um, so first, we have to decide when we would lock an issue. So for us, it became two, two pieces of criteria. We only want to lo lock issues that are already closed. Uh, we're not looking to just stop people from, from talking to us or to say that their issue isn't important. This is when we've already resolved something. And then past that, we want to make sure that the conversation is actually ended. So for us, we decided on a, over 30 days of time where nothing has happened on the issue. So now that we know what our criteria are, we actually have to be able to discover what those issues are so that we can automatically lock them. So uh, we looked around at what our options for doing this were, were and there's a few different, um, different examples of uh, setups that have already been doing this. Nothing quite fit what we were looking for, and also we have been looking for a, reason, or a way to test out GitHub Actions, so we actually chose to use GitHub Actions for this. So uh, we're actually gonna, I'm going to walk through how our GitHub Action works. So first, we have to find the inactive closed issues. So we do that using GitHub's API. You're likely familiar with at least the syntax of what the queries look like, as it's the same thing that happens in the regular UI. Uh, we're going to check what the actual repository we want to look in, in this case, Angular Angular. We want to make sure we're only looking at closed issues. Uh, we actually want to look at only unlocked issues, because believe it or not, if you try to lock a locked issue, it does nothing. And we want to look for things that have been updated 30 days or more um, ago. So for instance, for today, that would mean looking at August 21st of this year. And then the last thing is we want to make sure that we sort so that, the, that the, we see the, the oldest issues first, or the, 
oldest updated issues first. So that if we have more issues than we're ready to lock at once, we start from the, the oldest and work our way back. So now that we have this query, we actually have to go and lock these discovered issues. So it's relatively simple as a, as a process. We, use, we create a GitHub client using GitHub's JavaScript API client, which is called OctaKit. And then we use that query we just, we just made and search for the issues that we are interested in. And then we loop through all of those issues, and we lock them. And it looks really easy. All you do is just call lock issues. But uh, what lock issue actually does is uh, we create a comment because we thought it was really important that we explain why we're locking the issues. So we have the same comment that shows up on all of our issues that are automatically locked and explains why we locked it, where you can go for our policy, as well as making sure to note that a bot has done this action and it's not, it's not anything against the people involved in the conversation. It's just that this criteria has been met. And then finally, we actually lock the issue. So the GitHub action is relatively simple. Um, we just run this uh, for our repository um, uh, on like a cron job, and it will actually lock all the issues. So we actually have to enable this for our repos, though. So uh, to do so, GitHub Actions are just uh, configured using a YAML file. So this is actually um, outside of the, the commit uh, message, or the commit number, I guess, uh, on the slide. This is actually what we use for the Angular Angular um, repo. So we set it up to run every day uh, at midnight, and we are able to just reference uh, the, the lock closed uh, action that we already created. So we actually are now seeing all of these results. So over the last three weeks since uh, we turned this on, we've locked about 60,000 uh, closed inactive issues. Um, so for those of you who were subscribed to our GitHub repo and I caused a lot of spam to go to you, it's over. You can turn your notifications back on. And uh, now we just run it uh, once a day, and we're just seeing a few, day, a, few a day um, instead of this massive number. Um, and I really want to make sure that I note here, uh, Charles is actually the one who wrote the majority of this code, um, and I just wanted to thank him for all of his work on it. Um, since I definitely uh, am standing and talking about it, but he's the one who came up with most of how we do it. So next, I want to talk about how we build the Angular framework itself. So it's getting more complex. If we step backwards and look, oh, sorry, at the problem. We're not going to step backwards yet. Uh, as Angular continues to grow, it's getting more complex and bigger. And that actually takes, makes it take longer to build and test all of the code. So we need to find a way to not take it, make it take as long, because that makes the, our developer experience worse. So if we look back now at AngularJS, building was simple. We had a bunch of files, and we combined them together, and we had our application. But now with Angular, we've added this, trans this transpiling that happens with TypeScript. So now we have to take the TypeScript files, turn them into the JavaScript files, and then combine them. And that step of transpiling is, or building is really where uh, the, time, the time is growing. So this is, this is a very simple application of four files, as an example. Uh, but let's say we were to just update one of those files. Then once that one file is updated, we would have to transpile every the TypeScript file again and then combine them together. But it doesn't actually make sense, because three of them, it's the exact same thing. So we actually want to do this incrementally and only transpile the files that have been changed. And uh, just reuse the results from before. And so you've heard us talk a lot about how we use Bazel to do this. But this, is, this incrementality concept is actually something that Bazel provides, but is a general concept that um, we feel is extremely valuable for making builds um, as efficient as possible. So as I said, that was a really simple application. But most applications that I've seen, at least, have more than four files. You could have hundreds or thousands of files. And pretty quickly, we can become CPU bound, because you can only be checking or only compiling one file at a time with TypeScript. So let's say for my MacBook, for instance, it has two cores. So with hyperthreading, that's four. At maximum, I could be doing four at once. And it's a really fast process, but you still have to go through all of them. So 
we actually want to scale this out horizontally. Because all these cores could be used for something more useful, or at least more entertaining for myself. So instead of building these actions locally all on the machine, we can actually build them using remote build execution and send all of that work to the cloud, to some cloud executors to do this. So now, instead of being bound to just the four threads that I'm able to use, we could use however many cloud executors we have and expand that out. So now, instead of building locally, we're building these things in the cloud and getting back the results. But if things are building on the cloud instead of building on our own machine, we would lose that incrementality that we just talked about. So to get that back, we actually do remote caching. So with remote caching, the build is done remote and then saved. And then any time we, uh, we attempt to build again, we do that same caching or, or incrementality concept, but just doing it remotely. But one of the big advantages here is that once we build it remotely, it's available for anybody who is building remotely. So by all using the same remote uh, build executors and the same remote cache, uh, all of our developers, as well as our CI, can build the same objects and not, have to, and not have to rebuild them for each other. So once I build Angular core once, if nothing has changed, nobody else should have to build it again. We can just use it over and over. So over the last few months, we actually have set up remote build execution and remote caching for the Angular repository. We currently only take advantage of it in our CI, but we've actually found that, for instance, on our unit tests, uh, we've seen a 33%, um, or we are 33% faster in running those. So you can see how at the beginning of this graph, we were adding more tests, more complexity, and it was growing. And then around this point, we enabled remote build execution and caching, and our graph went down. And you might be thinking, Joey, that's not centered. That's because there's more to the graph. I broke it, then it fixed it, <laughs> and now it's, it's flattening out again, so we're good. So it brings us to our next topic. We want to move fast and break nothing. So this is actually uh, about how we manage code moving into our repository. So we need to bring in a lot of changes, as I mentioned, more than 135 pull requests each week. And we want to merge them as quickly as possible. But we need to not break anything for our users. So we need to maintain quality all the time. So to be able to achieve this, uh, we attempt to capture and mechanize as much as possible everything we can for deciding when a PR is actually ready to merge. So we require code reviews for all PRs. And we require that code, owner, that code review to come from someone who owns the code. And by doing this, we ensure that the code actually is maintaining the quality that we expect, as well as the, the conformance rules. And then we also maintain that the code that's being committed is actually going where we want it to go. We aren't going in a different direction, because the code owner is responsible for, for the direction of that portion of the code. We also do a lot of testing on CircleCI. So, uh, we have code and commit conformance, contest, conformance tests, so we make sure things like linting and um, that the code that the code has changed has an owner. Um, and then we actually make sure that at any point in time, we can create an NPM package with what is currently in our repo. So we test actually packaging it, uh, making that uh, NPM package. Um, we don't put it anywhere, but we make sure that it builds and is valid. We also run unit tests and integration tests across multiple operating systems and multiple browsers. And since our documentation site is stored alongside of our code, we test that the documentation site still works as we expect for every build that happens. So we've talked uh, on stages in the past about how Google actually builds using Angular at master. So to make sure that's possible, we actually have to check that we don't break anything in Google for everything that we want to bring into, bring into our repository. So luck, and luckily for us, Googlers are very good at using code, what I've decided to call creatively. And it leads to a very solid test suite, because what seems to be any possible usage of the code is found somewhere in Google's, in Google's repository. So we have hundreds of thousands of tests that are checked for each PR before we merge them into GitHub. And we actually are doing the same thing now for testing Ivy. So we test 
uh, view engine code and make sure that it passes 100%. And for Ivy, we currently are at just under 98%. So we're testing to make sure that we aren't regressing back. So to maintain this, as I mentioned, we have to do this on all 135 PRs, which is a lot of work. And additionally, we have more than 30 people who could theoretically go to GitHub and press that merge button. So this would be absolute chaos if everybody just merged whenever they felt things were ready. So instead, we came up with a new role on our team, the caretaker. So the caretaker is responsible for making sure that, that our repo stays in order. So because of all of the, um, the checks that we just walked through, if everything there is passed, the, anybody, regardless of their understanding of the code itself that's being, that's being merged, can be confident that if, if all of those checks have passed, it's ready to be merged. And so it takes away the responsibility of deciding when it's appropriate to merge it, and it just makes it so that as soon as all of our, tests, all of our checks pass, we can go ahead and merge it. So this, the caretaker is responsible for actually doing that merging. They also monitor our CI, categorize incoming issues so that they can be triaged. They're also responsible for syncing those changes into Google and for uh, releasing new versions of Angular at the end of their rotation. Um, so it's a, quite a task. So we actually have an internal application uh, that we use to just manage this process for ourselves. Um, it allows us to create some uh, different sorting and different uh, filtering around what we care about to determine what's ready. And it also allows us to keep track of where things are going wrong and what's kind, what needs to happen for something to get into the right state. Um, so brings us to the last thing that I want to talk about, perfecting developer infrastructure. I know what you're thinking. Joey, it's a lot of success that you just talked about. You did it. You perfected it. No, it's not perfect. But we have very well shown that by dedicating time to making sure that our processes and tools get better, we are making things better for the people that are making Angular. So I just wanted to talk about a few things um, that I see as places that we can find impacts next. Um, we often talk about how the Angular Angular repository works, but the reality is that uh, we actually manage a lot of different repos within the Angular org. And so if we can unify the processes that happen across those repos, uh, we can be even more efficient and reduce the, the overhead that it takes to manage all of those things. Uh, so also with respect to the Caretaker app, uh, with the help of one of our interns this summer, Alyssa, we've been working on a new version of that Caretaker app that we hope to make available publicly that would give insight into the progress of each PR so that people can see what is being done on a PR or where a PR is at in the process and kind of demystify how things are happening through our repo. And lastly, I want to automate everything. Ideally, we would automate writing the code, but I don't think we're there yet. So things like cherry picking things automatically to patch branches, rebasing PRs, pushing new documentation, and automatically following up to ask for reproductions are all things that I think that we could start looking to automate to make ourselves uh, more efficient. So thank you. Um, the slides are available there, as well as if you want to look at the actual code for our um, automatic locking, it's available in our dev info repo. Thanks.